what it means. A woman is described as heavy chested. Yes. Okay. What, what would you what would you imagine? The f going on here, boys? Um, you cannot see his chest in this uh, this photograph, can you? No, not. What the f going on, bro? Day 32 of the Young Thug YSL Rico trial was baffling. State is trying to introduce a 911 call from 2013 where the caller says she heard from someone that Young Thug shot at someone. Thug's lawyer doesn't want this to be shown and says it's double hearsay and violates the confrontation clause in the Sixth Amendment. The detective who shot his gun at the fleeing car testifies about the incident. Four people are in this fleeing car. Two of them get away and are never caught. One of them who does get caught is Walter Murphy and the other I believe is Adrian Bean. There's no real solid proof that Thug was even there, but Adrian Bean, one of the guys that was in the car on a jail call says Thug was in the car and he's apparently going to come up and testify. The detective that shot the gun, his testimony is terrible. It's almost like he's never testified in his life. You're going to see what I mean towards the end of this video. Hit subscribe. Here we go. And I, I'm going to give you a time deadline. I want to start with my jury at 11 o'clock, okay? So sure. I want to be finished by that time. That's the time I told him that. The judge rushing it even though he wastes time so much in the courtroom to be honest. Hello, now I'm one operator 6197. What's the address of the emergency? It's, it's not an emergency. The guy that shot the guy over here off Cleveland Avenue, he's in my friend on the apartment and she's panicking. She don't know what to do. Okay, what's going on? There's a guy, I guess somebody must have shot somebody over here where I said over here in Somerdale. But you cannot come to my house or to our Okay, ma'am. When, when I'm coming to your location, uh -huh. I just need to know what's going on. If, was somebody shot recently? Yes, about five. The police said where I go. Okay. What's the location? It's over here on Cleveland Avenue. Cleveland Avenue. What else, ma'am? I need numbers or two uh, cross streets. Oh, I don't want to talk loud. I don't want to get nobody get myself in no trouble. That's fine. That's crazy that she's scared to speak up to the police because she doesn't want to get, you know, retaliation from someone if they find out she's snitching. My friend apartment, she panicking. She don't know what to do. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. But well, she got her, her mom and her baby now. Okay. Who was shot? I, I have no idea, baby. I, I promise I can't tell y'all that. I don't know. All that I know, she came around, she came to my house and told me that the guy that shot, that shot somebody in that young thug would have supposed to be. Shot somebody and then the guy is in her house. And there it is. There's no way they can show this to the jury, right? This is like completely hearsay. She's hearing this from someone else that he shot someone? Like what? This is hearsay. All right. And you want, do you want your name or number? No, 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 okay. no, please don't call me that. Yes, ma'am. You know my, you know my uh, truth and uh-uh, no. Okay, I'm like, I want them to come back and retaliate against me. She just, yeah, that's crazy. She said, I don't want them to come back and retaliate against me. All right, please don't uh, tell me how to make the call. Yes, ma'am, we won't, well, they won't call you back and I don't have your name. All right, thank you. Your Honor, where we start is there's two issues I would like the court to address. The first one is the confrontation clause. And in a confrontation clause situation, and we're dealing with a 911 recording, there is nothing special about a 911 recording. I saw that the state's uh, reply this morning said that 911 recordings are generally admissible. That's not accurate. That comes right out of Pitts versus State, which I've given the court. The court has. Yes. Mr. Williams and everyone have the right to confront the witness. That, that is the, that's how we start. That's how the Constitution put it out. That's in the Sixth Amendment confrontation clause that he's talking about. Everyone has the right to confront the witnesses against them. So these witnesses, or witness, either one of them, the, the supposed caller or the supposed unknown neighbor, they are not being called as um, witnesses at our trial. Therefore, it starts out with, this is inadmissible. It's just inadmissible on confrontation clause. And the caller's first words when the 911 operator said, you know, what's your emergency? The caller immediately said, it's, and then there's three dots. It's not an emergency. So Steele is saying since she said it is not an emergency, meaning that the shooting happened at a different time and there is an immediate danger. The caller does not really know what's going on. The caller says immediately after that, this is not an emergency, she, she states, the guy that shot the guy over here off Cleveland Avenue, he's in my friend's apartment and she's panicking. She don't know what to do. 911 operator said, what's going on? The other known caller says, the guy, I guess, she speculates, somebody must have shot somebody over here where I stay at over in Somerdale, but you cannot come to my house or through my house. So what she is saying is she is repeating information that she doesn't know if anyone got shot, but she guesses that, assuming that, and we really don't know the basis. Maybe she maybe she knows it because she was told it by the neighbor. Maybe she knows it because she heard it on the news. Maybe she really never knew it. It's a strong argument from uh, Brian Steele right here. The caller is also not panicked by saying, you gotta get here now, you gotta get here now. The caller is constantly saying, I don't want my name to be used. I don't want my children's name to be used. You don't have my address, don't have my telephone number. You can't have my name because I don't want retribution. I agree. If they want to have this 911 call there, that lady got to be up on the stand. She's got to be called as a witness. So she's not saying you got to get here, you got to get here, you got to get here, get here now. She has the wherewithal to say, I don't want to be involved. Caller says, I have no idea, baby. I promise you, I can't tell you all that I don't know. And then she goes through. The only thing I know is that my neighbor came running. She came to my house, told me the guy that shot, that shot somebody named Young Thug or whoever that's supposed to be. 
shot somebody and the guy is in her house. So I don't know y'all can do that. I'm trying to get her out of the house, but you won't answer the phone. So I asked the court to understand and consider this. When, when I went through this, I realized that the neighbor then was in the house, according to the caller, but then left the house. So somehow the neighbor's not trapped in the house. The neighbor then returns to her own house. That's what's going on here in this 911 call. So clearly this is not a emergency where the neighbor comes over to, to um, the caller's house and says, call the police. My child and my mother are there and there's a person in there that's threatening us. I need to go back in and help my mother and my daughter because there's an ongoing emergency situation. That didn't happen because we know that the neighbor, according to this caller, if any of it's true, the neighbor comes over, somehow freely leaves her apartment. She doesn't say she escaped from the apartment. She doesn't say that she was being beaten in the apartment. She doesn't say anything. And she uses this term to then say she went back. In addition to that, Your Honor, after the neighbor leaves the apartment of the caller, the caller does not call 911 immediately because the caller is telling the 911 operator later on, it says, my neighbor will not answer the phone. That's them calling now, meaning that the neighbor went back to her home or went wherever she went. And she made a phone call to the caller, unknown caller calling 911. That means that all of this is that this is a mishmash. In addition to that, the only place in here that names what I'm going to say, I'm going to adopt Jeffrey Williams, a young thug. Where did that information come from? It can be presumed that it came from unknown neighbor, but did it come from someone else? Because it says that shot somebody named Young Thug or whoever that's supposed to be. So was Young Thug shot? Young Thug do a shooting? I don't know, but when it says somebody named Young Thug or whoever that's supposed to be, without this caller here asking her questions, pointed questions saying, where did you get that information from? It, it is it is a violation of Constitution Clause rights. Bottom line is that doesn't go to the emergency. That information comes from somewhere that we have the right to cross-examine. So that would have to be at the minimum redacted. When you're in a panic and you're calling for help, you don't think about things like, don't tell them I called, because it's supposed to be so fresh that the only issue is I need help, my, my building is on fire. I need help, the, the glass just broke and I'm covered in bleeding. I need help, I just had a heart attack and I'm laying on the ground, I'm losing consciousness. It was not panic, she said it's not an emergency. I'm not going to repeat, but it's all of the issues that I am raising. If there's an ongoing crime, she doesn't know. She says somebody's in there that was shot or shot. I she's relaying third, she's relaying that. third party information. Yes, and you can't assume, you know, at first, when I first listened to this, Your Honor, I thought, oh, okay, this is coming directly, you know, from a listener, from the neighbor. Then I realized I have no idea who this is coming from. She never says, meaning the caller, I got this from my neighbor. It says she's my neighbor. referencing some other person. Exactly. I don't know if she got it from a third neighbor or her, someone else called her, et cetera. Damn, dude, yeah. Okay, maybe the judge, it sounds like the judge could actually end up ruling on this in favor of the defense here. So clearly the neighbor is free to use a cell phone, free to enter her home and free to exit her home. That doesn't sound like anyone is saying, I am being held um, against my will. I am being um, accosted. I am being the victim of something. It sounds more like they are reporting that a shooting happened and either the person was shot or the person shot someone and that is not the ongoing emergency that we are talking about i think this is double hearsay they literally say their call is not an emergency and we don't know how much time passed there's a lot of assumptions is that in a 30 minute time span was that in a two hour time span? we don't know this is what the state's going to argue present sense impression a present sense impression is defined as a statement that describes an event while it was occurring or immediately after this is clearly hearsay it's an out-of-court statement offered into evidence for the truth of the matter asserted if it's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted then it has no probative value under 401 402. the only two i found that may be appropriate and i'm not i'm not conceding by when i say that but maybe you know even in play are um, two of them. And the first one I have is present sense impression. Present sense impression right here. What are you talking about? That person has to witness it. What they're talking about, they have to observe it. So I saw a person jump out of the building that I was in and I saw the body come through my window. I saw that and I related. I saw the smoke come out of the car and then it went boom. I heard the, um, the shots, the gunfire. Those are all issues that I can relate because I observed it. This person, all she observed is my neighbor came in in a panic, came into my home, went back to her home. She called, I called her, she wouldn't answer the phone. She called me while I'm on the phone with 911 and it's not an emergency. All right, so now the prosecutor's up. She's gonna argue why this 911 call should be shown to the jury. Here we go. Judge, I'll start with the words, um, panicking. Doesn't know what to do. Her mama and her baby are in there. I'm trying to get her out of the house. She won't answer the phone. She doesn't know what to do. Please don't tell anybody that I made this call. It's to get assistance for what the caller perceived as an immediate danger. Did she perceive it as immediate danger if she literally said this is not an emergency off rip? Officers had gone to this apartment for a reason altogether unrelated to any shooting or anything like that. When they got out there, they heard gunshots and they saw Walter Murphy, who we later learned was Walter Murphy, shooting at a man named Derek Dotson. The officers turned and went to pursue Walter Murphy. And when they did, he jumped into a red Nissan and they noted that there were four individuals in the Nissan. The Nissan comes, speeds off, crashes over a wall and crashes into a brick wall, four people get out running. And that other call is the 911 call that the court heard today. And when they reached out over the radio and said, we got this caller who's calling in about 
this guy, the shooting um, at Somerdale, Young Thug, they then learned that it's related to the first series of calls. And that's how they all got put together in the first place. So it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't happen not wanting to be identified, describing her neighbor having come to her in a panic just a moment ago. And now she's not answering her call. For all she knows, that neighbor is in there dead. The reason that she is saying what she is saying about the shots and the police, she's not even able to get it out. In a, in a very um, cohesive way. She's saying, I don't know, just come, just come now. Her whole purpose for calling was to get the police to respond to what she perceived as immediate danger. Unknown female is talking about. I assume that you're not bringing the unknown female or the neighbor in. Is that correct? So, Your Honor, that is correct. And that would go to um, the issue of hearsay that I'll address in a moment. The issue is, she starts off by saying it's not an emergency. Her statement is, I have no idea, baby. I promise you, I can tell you all. I don't know. The only thing I know is she came running. She came to my house. She told me that a guy, that the guy that shot, that shot someone named Young Thug or whoever, that's supposed to be shot someone and that guy is in her house. So we don't really have, I mean, there's no granularity. I, I agree with Mr. Steele about what is actually going on. I could, I could parse out several hypotheticals <clears throat> of what she calls or claims may have happened. So it sounds like the judge may rule in favor of the defense here soon. I don't think this 911 call should be shown. It's from 2013. What are we doing here? Something happened over and my, my neighbor came over here panicking, saying someone named Young Thug shot someone. What are we doing? Double hearsay. It's unlike pits and the other cases where you've got somebody who's making that call you're basically it, it's already in a it's already in a third party situation because she's relating kind of what's what she's what she thinks is going on so that's kind of what i have to kind of decide to begin with is it is it is the call primary purpose testimonial in this case you've got a third party who really doesn't kind of we don't have granularity of what she's talking about i mean and so i have some problems with that to begin with Surprisingly, the judge has a brain today. Get this person out of my neighbor's house. Essentially, that's what she's saying. I don't want to call. The reason she says, and it is apparent from the call, objectively listening to it, the reason she says it's it's not an emergency, even though her voice is panicked, is that I don't she, think her voice is panicked. She's just she's kind of just talking. I mean, she's talking in low tones. Like, well, are we assuming what she was trying to say here? Like, what what is this? She said her voice is panicked. I don't think it was panicked either. Just, I'll disagree with you. I don't think. Yes, it's your an, honor. I don't think it's an emergency. Your I, I mean, and, he, and he, she herself says it's not an emergency. Like I said, I got to look at the primary purpose. For the call is the primary purpose for the 911 call to provide information that may be used later or is it for an emergency or some other reason in this particular circumstance it seems like she's relating information because that's the first thing out of her mouth i can't discount that the first thing out of her mouth is not emergency because 911 what's your emergency and she's not saying hey my neighbor is getting blah 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 or that that i heard this and and this and i've seen this and that's kind of where we are where she's relating a third party court would prefer or ask like for me to play the call again just um, so that I can point out those areas, I would like to, with the court's permission. No, don't play the call again, Q, no. Out of court statement from someone that's not gonna be called as a witness. It's not an emergency. She literally says it's not an emergency. I'm over this shit. So the judge just asked for a recess to think it over. Hold up, I got a suit on today. Look at this fancy suit, looking snazzy. I think the judge deferred his ruling on this. This is Captain Derek Page. The mugshot that was taken at some point during that booking process. When you booked it to the Fulton County Jail. Booking information of uh, Huey. May 26, 2018. This is just a side shot of his mugshot. Like I said, they take two different shots. So a facial shot as well as to the side. Mr. Mark Wavy, excuse me. This is the booking page for Mr. Jeffrey Williams. Uh, this is actually my first time seeing this right here. Okay. Um, the foundation and the speculation. So Wait, he's never seen this before? How is he testifying to this? Just because he has experience with booking people? He's never seen thugs booking shit, but they're trying to show it to him on the stand. So this witness is essentially here to show a mugshot of thug. That's what's happening right now. To show the jury this mugshot of young thug. It's funny that they're showing this when I'm like 99% sure if my memory doesn't fail me that this case was completely dismissed. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey Williams. Side shot of his mugshot. I told you it comes in two different shots, a facial shot as well as a side shot. And um, how is, uh, can you describe the hair in this photo? Uh, appears to be dreads with um, blonde dreads in it as well. Now Thug's lawyer, Mr. Adams, is up for cross. I think I heard you say before, you've not seen these this book in sheet before, right? In reference to Mr. Williams? That's correct. No, not prior to today, no. You were showing it uh, what, sometime this morning? That is correct. Okay, by the state, I presume? Yes. Okay, they said you'd be coming in here to testify about this booking sheet and the, I guess, the photographs that were attached to it, right? That is correct. Okay. You, you don't have any independent personal knowledge about this booking or the circumstances surrounding it, right? No, sir, I do not. All right. You know Oscar Michael Monheim, the person who's listed as the arresting officer? Do I know him? No, sir. No, sir, I don't. Okay. Do you know anything about the circumstances of uh, Officer Michael Monheim arresting Mr. Williams on this date? I do not. Okay. Do you know anything about the outcome of this case? I do not. Okay. Yes, I believe it'd be accurate. Yeah, but you don't have any personal knowledge as to whether any of this information is accurate. You're just basing it on what was printed out by the computer. That is correct. Okay. What else on this sheet is, uh, is there anything on here that's inaccurate? I do not know. Casting doubt on all the information on this sheet and really downplaying his testimony that he was just called in here to read off this paper and he doesn't really know anything about the incident at all i'm sure he's going to try to point out this case was dismissed or something so the information at least the date of birth it looks like somebody put that information in incorrectly it's wrong right i don't know 
Okay. Oh, oh, his age is wrong. It says he's 32, not 22. Jesus. I don't know anything about his arrest records. Okay. Do you know what lace front is? Uh, I imagine it's something similar to a wig, I guess. It's kind of a wig, right? Yes. You know what it means when someone says uh, someone has blonde hair? Yeah, they have blonde hair. Yeah. Look to your, look to your left. See the young lady there? Yes. Okay. Blonde hair, right? Yes. Okay. What it means when uh, someone, a woman, is described as heavy chested. Yes. Okay. What, what would you, what would you imagine? The f going on here, boys? Not imagine, imagine. What would that be? If you were to describe a woman as heavy chested, what would, what would your description be? I guess. Uh, <laughs> if he knows, I'm become relevant. <laughs> I'm gonna sustain that. What's relevance? What? Well, I really want to know where he was gonna go with that. What? You cannot see his chest in this uh, this photograph, can you? No, I cannot. What the f going on, bro? Did this police report say Thug got big titties or something? Pointing out the inconsistencies in this report, and maybe it said that Thug's hair was blonde and that he had titties. You don't know, as you sit here today, how this particular uh, each one of these charges, how they resulted. Uh, Ultimately in court, correct? I don't know, know the disposition. And you were asked to come here basically to just simply testify that this particular book and photo belonged to Mr. Hewitt, correct? For the most part, yes. I know the state's just trying to lay foundation and show the jury mug shots of people in the courtroom because a lot of what they've been talking about is not people in the courtroom. The, the, that was a waste of time. So after an hour and a half uh, comfort break, this is a detective that was involved in the uh, DK, Thug, and Adrian Bean incident. But DK is the only one that got charged with shooting at the cop, I think. Responded to 2,600 hate bill. Uh, I think it was aggravated assault. And uh, prior to us responding to that call, I had ran into a suspect. I ran into a guy that I was familiar with in that area, from patrol in that area. I just had a little small conversation with him. Earlier, before you responded to somebody in the apartment, you had saw another individual. Where did you see that person at? At the gas station. It was a BP on the corner of Cleveland Avenue and Hateville. And when you first saw the individual at the gas station, did you know him to be a suspect in anything when you first saw him at the gas station? No. All right. The victim gave a description of a male that was involved in, 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 in that, that incident. And when she gave the description, he fit the description of the gentleman I just spoke with prior to this incident. Okay. What? In the same area. And what happened once you made that realization that the person that the victim was describing matched the person you saw earlier that day? I was familiar with him and I knew that all, all of the guys that he hang with hangs out at that this apartment complex. We drove over to some of their apartments and a vehicle pulled up beside us on the residence side. It was a, a blue four door, it was a four blue, blue four door sedan and it was occupied by two black, two young black males appeared to be very young. Just continued to watch the vehicle because it was kind of suspicious. I was sitting on the front passenger side. AC Booker Higgins was sitting behind me in, in the back seat and investigator Porter was driving. Okay. The apartment complex. I continued to watch the vehicle. Um, the vehicle pulled over, pulled into a parking space. Uh, two black males got out of the vehicle and I continued to watch them as we drove by. Uh, we eventually drove, the investigative reporter eventually drove past him and just continued to drive to the back of the complex. Let me ask you this. Were the individuals that got out the car the, the initial suspect that you were looking for? No. Okay. We continued to travel to the back of the complex. Before we could get all the way to the back of the complex to go around, we heard gunshots. We heard a, a series of gunshots. I said, those are gunshots. They thought they were fireworks. I said, no, those are gunshots because it sounded like a series of shots. I said, Porter, turn around. So when she turned back around, we started heading back. I saw a, a gentleman with a red shirt running behind another female, another male shooting. So I I said, Porter, go, go, go. So eventually, I thought Porter missed him. She didn't see him. I, I thought she didn't see him because she was ready to drive by him. So I just said, stop right here. And I jumped out of the car and pulled, I had my weapon. I told her to pull out on the radio, which is mean, you know, just let radio know, radio know where we are and what's going on. I didn't have really much time to communicate because I was reacting to the incident. So I got out with my gun out and I had my gun out on a, on a, on a gentleman that, that had on the red and he just took, started running towards me. I was standing right next to the car. I didn't know that he was running towards this car. So he got into a maroon car. He jumped into the, um, he jumped into the rear back seat of a maroon car. So I got close up on the car so I could see inside the car. I wanted to, you know, so I told everybody, let me see your hands. Put your hands where I could see him. I looked at the driver in the car because I stood on the angle so where I could see into the car, see, every, see everybody. This is a lot. I'm confused. So he saw a car in this apartment complex that looked sketchy, kept an eye on it. It sounded like the car pulled around the corner and then he heard gunshots and then all these people were running or some shit. That's what I got from this so far. The driver looked me in my face, rubbed the engine, put the car in drive. And as he pulled off, I jumped out the way and I shot a shot. And he he hit my um he hit investigators porters. He hit the car with, with the, the two investigators in it because they never got out of the vehicle. So he hit them he hit them and I fired another shot after that. You know, at this time he's being reckless. The whole incident they was being reckless. My life was in jeopardy. My partner's lives was in jeopardy, and so was everybody else's lives around us. So the vehicle just sped off out of at a high rate high rate of speed out of the apartment complex. He smashed the front gate, and once he smashed the front gate, he went up in the yard of. Right directly across the street from the apartment complex. And from that point on, he went out of my side of view. I think he went off the side. He, he went off the side of the embankment. Okay. So we're going to sit there pretty fast. So we're oh, going to slow sorry, sorry. It's okay. So we're going to slow down a little bit. Yeah, he doesn't seem very good at uh, testifying. This is his first time up on the f***ing stand. Bro's yapping up there. When you say you saw a person um, in a red shirt shooting, how far were you when you saw that person shooting? Mm, i say approximately 10, 15 feet. Were you in the car when you first saw him shooting? Or did you see him shooting once you got outside of the vehicle? I saw him shooting 
running away from the vehicle shooting with my back turned. I didn't see, I didn't actually see the gun in his hand. I heard the gunshots and I saw him because his back was towards me. But as I got closer to me, I saw, I saw the gun in his hand and that's when I jumped out. Okay. And then I had my weapon on him and I'm telling him to like drop the weapon. I'm, I'm telling him to drop the weapon, but he, he didn't comply. He just c continued to run towards the car. The car that he runs to, how far are you from that car? Um, to be honest, I wasn't sure how far it was. It was behind me. I, I, I was focused on the threat at the time. I got kind of like tunnel vision at the- Did you see that individual get into the car? Yes. Once he got into the car, what did you do? Um, I ran up on the car. And when you, when you say you ran up on the car, where were you? I positioned myself like on the corner. That way I could see all angles of the car. Like on the corner where I'm in the, like, you know, like towards the, f the right front, the right front light. And was this car pulled in or was it back then? It was back then. All right. So when you go up to the car, are you now facing the driver? No, I was facing, I was facing the passenger, the passenger and the, the driver. The driver, I could see, I could see both of them clearly. Actually, I saw both of them, but I couldn't tell you what they looked like. I kind of locked in on, the, I kind of locked in on, on the driver because I wanted to make sure he saw me. I was like, you know, showing eye contact with him. So trying, I was locking in with him to make sure he saw me because I wanted to make sure he saw me. And so, you said you want to make sure he saw you. So the driver, was it a male? Yes, it was a male. Yes. So who is it? Let's get to the fucking, like, what, what, what are we doing here? Were you able to see the passenger? The no. Front passenger? No, I couldn't tell you what the passenger looked like. Do you know if the passenger was a male or a female? No. Right. Were you able to tell, to see if there was anyone else in the car besides the person in the red shirt that got into the vehicle? Yes. Was there anyone else in the car? Yes. It was from, I only saw three people in the car. It, I only saw three people in the car, yes. So you saw the driver? You shook your head? Yes. You saw the person in the red shirt that got into the car? Yes. And who was the third person that you saw in the car? I don't know who the third person was. Where were they seated in the car? They were sitting in the, they were sitting in the passenger seat. So you saw that there was a body in the passenger seat, but you can't tell if it was a male or a female? Correct. I, I moved out the way. And then he hit he hit, he hit, hit the police. He hit the, uh, the Taurus. And when he hit the Taurus, he knocked the Taurus out the, he knocked the Taurus out the way a little bit and proceeded going straight. Do you recall what side of the Taurus he hit? I'm looking at the photos, he hit it on the right-hand side, but I couldn't tell you, to be honest, like when the first when, when, it, when it initially happened, I couldn't tell you what, what angle he hit it. But you know he hit the vehicle? Yes, I just know he hit it. Would that be the reason why homicide was there to investigate the officer involved shooting? Yes. And is that because you discharged your firearm? Yes. Was there an investigation? Yes. And what's the status of that investigation? Uh, um, it was, I was clear. I've learned nothing from that. They haven't identified anyone. All right, so here's Thug's lawyer, Mr. Adams. Let's see him cook. Here we go. Now, you didn't see the gun being fired. You heard the gunshots. Yes. You could see that that person had a gun in their hand. When I got close enough. Am I correct that you hear the shots and then you get out of the car and that's when you see the, the person running behind you? Other person? Got out the car once I saw him running with the gun in his hand. Once I got close enough to see it. What you're looking at at that point is you're looking at two people, right? Yes. You're seeing someone in front who's running, right? Yes. And another person in a red shirt behind, running after or running behind that person, shooting. Yes, they turned around and ran towards me because I was standing next to the car. I didn't know that this is the car that they were running to because okay. I didn't pay attention to the car. I was looking at the threat. When did the other person go to? The person who was being chased? When did that person go to? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. He just disappeared. I don't know if he ducked off between some cars or something or around. I don't know where he went. He just he disappeared. Just gone? Yes. All right. But red shirt guy gets in the, gets in the maroon car. And at that point, you are where in relationship to the car? Right beside the car. All right. And is it the car? What is it? Pulled into a parking space? Is it back into a parking space? It was back then. All right. It's back in the way. Were you in front of the car? No, it's on the side of it. What side? On the passenger side. Okay. This is the most confusing testimony I've heard in a while. The two guys were running towards him. One disappeared. One looked at him in the eyes, got in the car, and he let him get in the car and drive away. And he shot at him while he's driving away. I got on an angle. Okay. I was on the passenger side. Okay. okay. I come to the angle. That way I could see all parties in the car. Okay. I wanted to see their hands. And I was saying, let me see your hands. Right. So I could see everybody, but I was mainly, I was keen in on the, on the driver because I wanted to make sure the driver saw me because I wanted him to stop the car. I didn't want him to, to, to move. I wanted everybody in the car. Okay. That was my intent to get everybody out the car. I, I only, I only saw three people that I can, that I can honestly say that I'm not saying it wasn't more people. I only saw three. You saw three? Yes. Okay. And you right about the car? Yes. At that time, I didn't know. They said I fired, I might fire one shot, but you know, they don't, I don't, you don't know when, when, and it's like being in a fight. If you're in a fight, can you, somebody ask you how many times you, you hit a person? You probably won't remember. You were called upon. Were you ever called upon to give a description of uh, of the, the person you saw shooting, red shirt person? Yes. Okay. And then you were able to do that, right? Yes. Right. You remember at some point uh, when you were talking to, I guess, your superiors or, or internal affairs or somebody, them asking if you got a good look at the other occupants inside of the vehicle? You remember that question? Yes. You remember telling them that um, I don't remember what they look like? Correct. Okay. You know the difference between a male and a female, true? Yes. You know the difference between someone who is light skin and a, an African American person who's light skin and someone who's dark skin, right? Yes. I mean, there's a difference. You know what a lace front wig is? Yes. All right. You know what it means when someone has blonde hair? Yes. Do you know what it means to say that someone has a ponytail, their hair tied back? Yes. Do you know what it means when uh, someone might describe someone as being heavy chested? Yes. Uh, tell any of the investigators or any other officers on the scene um, that they need to, that the driver of the vehicle is a female? No. Did you at any point end up telling any of the officers or investigators on the scene that the driver of the vehicle uh, would have blonde hair and a lace front wig? Did, did you tell anybody that? No.
in terms of what was found at the scene, evidence, um, shell casings or not shell casings, anything like that, you weren't involved in that and you weren't advised of the findings, the physical findings of the scene. They didn't tell me anything. Okay. We're in imminent danger of being run over and possibly killed by that driver of that vehicle, right? Yes. Um, that same driver of this, this, this maroon vehicle um, hit a vehicle that your colleagues were in, Porter and Booker Higgins. Yes. Evidently, uh, or obviously evidencing uh, that driver of the vehicle's uh, intention to do harm, as far as you can tell, to the folks in the vehicle and get out of there. Correct. I just told what I saw. I don't. I just told whatever was in that statement. I I didn't see no woman. Yeah, but you didn't see no woman. I didn't see a woman. Okay. Well, well I'm asking you. No. Were you were you asked specifically back then whether or not it was a male or female driving that car? No, I wasn't asked if it was a male or female. I just gave a statement on what I saw. That's got to be the most confusing testimony of all times. They didn't identify anyone in the courtroom or talk about who was in this car. There's confusion about the female driver. We did a lot of patrolling, just riding around, learning the area, and that was about it for that time. Uh, I was sitting in a patrol car, and I was, I'm not sure what I was doing on the computer, but I remember hearing gunshots. Sometime later, I just remember a car airborne, going airborne over me and hit running into the wall of the laundromat. What else, if anything, do you remember about that particular event? That's about it. The two people they got to testify doesn't know shit about the situation, bro. Auto accident until suddenly four black males, I remember the front two wearing white shirts, started to run from the vehicle, from the car. Both I and black got out of the vehicle. I began to run behind two fleeing suspects that jumped the gate when black told me to come back and get the male suspect laying on the ground. I remember the male had a tattoo on his face with the letter D. This is Walter Murphy, the guy that she just said had a face tat with the letter D, I think is what she was talking about is this face tat right here. So this is them fleeing the scene and they went like over off of like ledge and ran into the back of a building. Damn, so this is what they drove over. Cops were parked right here. <laughs> oh my God, what idiots, bro. They flew off this past the cop car fleeing another scene what a disaster these idiots bro so I, I'm, I'm not seeing much proof that thug was in this car where's the proof that thug was in this car bro was he he wasn't arrested on this day where were you seated in the patrol car when that car flew over your head and crashed into that wall the driver's side and where were you in that patrol car or outside of it when four black males got out of that red car and ran? i was inside okay. you remember who came out of the driver's side of the vehicle i just know it was four males in a vehicle and four males got out okay you don't remember which these motherfuckers, this, these last two witnesses don't know shit, apparently. Dog wasn't identified by anyone today. Comment down below what you guys think. This shit was so confusing watching this in real time. Subscribe, love you guys. Peace out.